Hi and welcome to this last video for calculus for the P1 syllabus. Uh, in this video we're going to be looking at maximum and minimum problems, another really good application of calculus to real life situations. Uh, in this one here we're going to be looking at finding maximum and minimum values of functions. So in real life we're talking about the maximum profit that we could make, the minimum amount of fuel that we could use, um, Lots of econ uh, economics applications here, engineering, there's all kinds of uh, places where we use this idea. And basically the idea comes from, if you look at a graph and you want to find out where the, the turning point is, the maximum or the minimum value, and we already covered that back in the, um, in the third video on stationary points. So if you're looking for a stationary point, we know that that's where the derivative is equal to zero. So if, if the function we're talking about is our, our profit, then we want to know where is or what value is going to give us the maximum profit. So I'm going to take you through three problems going through these steps that I've outlined here. I won't describe them now, I'll just go through them as we do the problems. First problem is a classic. I think this is the one that everybody sees the first time they see this topic. I certainly did when I was at school. It might have been different numbers, but the same problem. We've got a farmer with 300 metres of fencing. He wants to fence a rectangular paddock for his sheep. On one side's a river, so he only needs three sides fenced. What we want to do is find the values of X and Y in my diagram here so that the sheep have the most amount of area possible. Okay, let's go through the steps outlined above. Firstly, we want to write down an expression or a formula for the area that we're looking for, for the, the function we're trying to find a maximum or minimum value for. So here it's the area, and the area very simply is just x times y. So you may, may need to come up with some variables here, uh, and write in an x and a y, or an a and a b, it doesn't matter. So x times y is the value that we're trying to find a maximum for. Now you've got to look for an extra bit of information here. The reason is, is that this formula here is in terms of two variables, x and y. The calculus that we're doing at this stage, we can only do derivatives with one variable. So we need an extra bit of information. The extra bit of information is right here. We've got 300 metres of fencing. So that means x plus y plus x has got to be 300. 2x plus y is 300. If I rearrange that, y is 300 minus 2x. Now we substitute that extra bit of information into our first equation. The area is x times y, which is x times 300 minus 2x. So a bit of substitution there. So by expanding, I now have a formula for the area only in terms of one variable. That's important. Now I can find, using calculus, the stationary point of that function. So we want to know when the derivative is equal to zero. So I do the derivative, 300 minus 4x. I want to know when that's equal to zero. It's a really easy one to solve. Add 4x, divide by 4. x is 75 meters. That is the stationary value. And when x is 75, going back to here, y is 300 minus 2 times 75, which is 150 meters. Okay, so that's our stationary value, and we've found it. It's the value where, if we were to draw a graph of this function for the area, you'll notice that this graph will be a parabola and it'll be upside down. Because of the minus in front of the x squared, it'll be upside down. So clearly this value we've found is a maximum value. But just to prove it, we're going to use the second derivative test. So we do the second derivative, which is minus 4. So we don't even need to substitute our value of x in there. It's just minus 4 which is less than zero, so that shows that the value we found is a maximum. And we want to know um, the values of x and y, so the paddock is maximum area. We've answered that. x is 75, y is 150. If the question asked us, what is that actual maximum area, we could work that out. The maximum area is just x times y, 11,250 metres squared. Now, it's good in this question to start thinking about, well, what if the farmer wanted to make the biggest area possible and that's a question you can think about you know should he draw like a half a hexagon at the side should he what kind of shape should he make the fence so that it encloses the most area so have a think about that ask your maths teacher it's a good problem to think about
So let's say that the length of the side that we're going to cut out of each corner is x, as you can see in this diagram. So we've folded the box up. You can see the box is x centimeters high. The length of the box here is now 30 minus 2x, because remember we took an x out of each corner. And the length of the box this way is 20 minus 2x. So if you imagine this length is 20, we've taken x off each side. So this length here now is 20, take off x, take off x. Okay, what's the volume of the box? Well, it's just this times this times this. So if we multiply those three brackets together, we get this expression here. So that's step one. Find the expression for the thing we're trying to find a maximum or a minimum for. So that's the volume. Notice we don't need any extra bit of information here, so that's good. We can do the derivative, dv dx. So that's easy. We get this expression here. And we want to know when that's equal to zero. Okay. So if we solve that equal to zero using the quadratic formula, I'll leave the details to you. We get two possible values of x. They're both positive, 12.74 or 3.92. Clearly, we can't have 12.74. If we cut a length of 12 out of each corner, remember this is only 20 centimeters across here, we wouldn't have anything. So we're going to chuck that, that solution out. That one doesn't make sense in this context. 3.92 looks like the best. Let's just check with the second derivative. So the derivative of this function that I've highlighted here, minus 200 plus 24x, substitute in our value for x we found, which is 3.92, and that gives us a negative value. So a negative value for the second derivative means that we've got a maximum. So this value of x produces a maximum volume. What is that maximum volume? Let's substitute 3.92 back into the original equation for the volume, giving us 1056 centimeters cubed. And here's the graph showing the uh, volume of the box for different values of x, kind of like we saw before. You can see 4 was pretty close, 3.9 was pretty close, 3.92 is spot on. Last example, we've got a salt shaker. Uh, radius R and height H, so it's basically a cylinder with a hemisphere, that's half a sphere sitting on the top there, and it's got a volume of 100 centimetres cubed. This is a very small salt shaker if you start looking at the calculation, so it's a, a kind of mini one. All right, so we're going to show that H is equal to that thing there, tricky. We're going to show that the surface area is given by that, and then given that R can vary, we can change the shape. Find the value of R for which S has a stationary value. In other words, find the value of R that minimizes the surface area. So if we've got a salt shaker of a, a specified volume, I want to know how should I make that salt shaker so that we minimize the surface area. In other words, minimize the materials that we're going to use to build this salt shaker. Now that might not seem like such a big deal if you're going to make 10 of them, but if you're going to make a million of them, you're going to save yourself a lot of money if you can find the exact right uh, dimensions here. So that's the problem. And the last one here, determine whether this station value is a maximum or minimum. So that's the second derivative test. So let's go through it. Okay, first of all, we want to work out the expression here for the volume of our salt shaker. So we've got a cylinder and a hemisphere on the top. So you need to know these formulas. Um, I've got them down here at the bottom. It's really good to know these. Um, you should be given the one for spheres. These bottom two you should be given in the exam. But for a cylinder and for the cylinder for the volume and the surface area, you should you should know that. Okay. So <clears throat> the volume is pi r squared h. That's the cylinder plus half a sphere, half of 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that gives me this imposing looking thing here at the end. Okay, now we know that that volume is 100. So I'm putting that equal to 100. And now all I have to do is get h on its own. This is tricky, people struggle with this. So to get this variable here on its own, first I'm gonna subtract 2 thirds pi r cubed. Then I'm gonna divide everything by pi r squared. Okay, so that gives me this step here. Now I'm going to deal with each thing separately. 100 divided by pi r squared and 2 thirds pi r cubed divided by pi r squared. So a bit of simplifying. 100 divided by pi r squared, that's as easy as we can get. 
2 thirds pi r cubed over pi r squared. You can see r cubed over r squared leaves you with r on the top. Uh, pi's cancel out, 2 on the top, 3 on the bottom, so 2r over 3, or 2 thirds r, is the value of h in terms of r. So part b now, we need to get an expression for the surface area. So the surface area is tricky, and I've broken it down here. We've got the curved surface area of the cylinder, so that's 2 pi r h. We've got the area of the bottom, that's pi r squared. And then we've got the surface area of the hemisphere, so a half of 4 pi r squared. Bit of a mathematical mouthful there. There we go. So that's the surface area. So let's tidy this up. Uh, 2 pi r h, we've got pi r squared plus a half of 4 pi r squared, so that's actually 2 pi r squared. So all together on the end there, we're going to end up with 3 pi, lots of r squared. Okay, Pi r squared plus 2 pi r squared is 3 pi r squared. The other thing that we can do is replace h with the value that we found in the previous bit. So we're going to replace h with 100 over pi r squared minus 2 r over 3. Okay, so from here we've just got to really be careful multiplying out. Remember that we're multiplying this 2 pi r here just by the top line. So 2 pi r times 100 over pi r squared. So that gives me 200, the pi's cancel, r over r squared is r on the bottom line. So that gives me this. 2 pi r times 2 r over 3. Remember this times the top line. So 2 pi r times 2 r is 4 pi r squared over 3. All right, now we're down to here. You can see that we've got two terms with r squared in them. So I can combine those together. We've got 3 pi lots of r squared minus 4 pi over 3 lots of r squared. So on our calculator, I can do 3 minus 4 over 3. 3 minus 1 and a third, if you like is 1 and 2 thirds, or 5 over 3 pi r squared. And that's what we're asked to find, an expression for the surface area in terms of r. Now, here's the calculus part. We want to find the value of r that gives us, in this case, a minimum surface area. So, we're going to do the derivative. So, the r on the bottom comes to the top. Here we go. So, r, on the, r to the power of 1 on the bottom becomes r to the minus 1 on the top. Number down the front, subtract 1 from the power. In this one here, number down the front, the 2 down the front, subtract 1 from the power. So 5 pi over 3 times 2 is 10 pi over 3. R to the minus 2 is R squared on the bottom. We want to know when this thing here is equal to 0. Okay, I always get rid of the fractions. So if we multiply every term by R squared, you get this expression here. And now add 200 to both sides, divide by 10 pi over 3 gives you... 19.098, etc., etc., etc. That's r cubed. Remember, don't round to the last step. You want that exact value on your calculator. Cube root of that is 2.67. Now you can round. 2.67 centimeters is the best value of r. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people ask, is this going to give you a maximum or a minimum? Well, you need to find out. So you need to check and see that this gives you a minimum. But basically, in these problems, you won't you won't have a difficulty where you get a maximum value when you're actually asking for a minimum. It always works out correctly. So let's just check. Doing the second derivative gives me this expression. I won't go through it. Substitute in 2.67 and we get a value greater than zero. The second derivative being greater than zero means we have a minimum value, so we've proved it. I've got a number of cool problems in the exercises here for you to have a go at. Um, this first one is a a problem similar to one that I remember from a long time ago from an exam um, about three towns. Uh, so we've got three towns A, B, B and C. We want to join them with roads. Uh, of course, the best way to do it is have a point here in the middle where the three roads kind of join up together. The question is, where do you put that point so that the length of the three roads is as small as possible? Okay, this point here is called the Steiner point of the triangle. So using calculus and these ideas we've just talked about, you should be able to find exactly where to put that point D. Once again, you're going to save a lot of uh, time and money if you can find the minimum length of these three roads if we have to build them.